up now. So that's approximately is about 160 to 180 students per kid. Minds park. Okay. Right. So the overall team. We've started the live stream. Um, Good afternoon to one and all present. I, Shruti. And I, Adi. Welcome you all to the webinar series under the technical exhibition at Mindspark 21, one of India's most coveted technical festivals. We hope all of you are doing well in these difficult times. The pandemic has affected all our lives in almost every aspect. We believe that every difficult situation is an opportunity for innovation. And here at Mindspark, we strive for the very same. Throughout this webinar series, we have tried to bring out the essence of this year's theme for MindSpark, curing mercurial visions by exploring a variety of topics. Today, we present a webinar on Square Kilometer Array, also known as SKA, an intergovernmental radio telescope project planned to be built in Australia and South Africa. The SKA will be the world's largest radio telescope located in South Africa and Australia with the international headquarters located at Jodrell Bank in the UK. Nearly 200 mid-frequency dishes will be located in the Karoo region of South Africa and around 130,000 low-frequency antennas will be located in Western Australia. There are currently 13 countries that are co-members, including the UK, South Africa, Australia, Italy, Germany, Netherlands, China, Sweden, Canada, New Zealand, India, Spain and France with more than 100 institutions in around 20 countries involved in the design of this telescope. Our esteemed guest speaker for today is Dr. Nick Rees, the head of computing and software at the SKA Observatory. Dr. Nick Rees grew up in Tasmania where he studied physics. After a short spell as a software engineer, he moved to Cambridge in 1984 to complete a PhD in radio astronomy where he was responsible for building, operating, and writing the processing and analysis software for a 38 megahertz radio telescope. The result was the 8th Cambridge survey of radio sources. After the PhD, he completed a postdoc where he built and commissioned an optical survey instrument for the William Herschel telescope before relocating to the Joint Astronomy Center in Hawaii in 1991. In Hawaii, he started as a software engineer working on the UK Infrared Telescope and ultimately was appointed Head of Software and Computing with the responsibility for the sub-millimeter James Clerk Maxwell Telescope as well. In 1984, he returned to the UK where he led the beamline controls and scientific computing teams of the Diamond Life Source X-ray Synchrotron. Finally, in 2016, after spending a career covering the radio, optical, infrared, submillimeter, and X-ray areas of the electromagnetic spectrum, he returned to radio astronomy as head of computing and software at the Square Kilometer Array Observatory. Thank you, sir, for taking time out of your busy schedule to address this session. Now, without any further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Reyes to take on our virtual dais and proceed with the webinar. Over to you, sir. Hello, everyone. Um, yes, when I, I started off this presentation, I thought I'd be talking a bit about how we, you know, the big data is really changing the way we work. And in a certain extent, that's what I'll be doing. But maybe a better title for this presentation is how big data is changing. And I found when I was doing the presentation, I took on a historical perspective. And so I hope you'll find this interesting. The outline of the talk is first to cover, understand what big data really is. Then I'll do radio astronomy in two slides. And then I'll go into this historical background of big data and radio astronomy in general. Finally, I'll return to the SKA and its data challenges and highlight two of the main systems that are approaching data challenges in different ways. One, the correlated beamformer, and the second being the science data processor. I'll finish off with some conclusions. So the first question is, what is big data? Well, often if you, if you Google this, at one, you'll find at one point it was fashionable to talk about the three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. 
So you characterize can characterize date big data by its size, how fast it was coming at you, and how uniform the data was or how non-uniform it was. Then people realized there was more to it than that. So IBM came up with four Vs, volume, velocity, variety, and veracity. So veracity means, you know, how much do you trust it? And then five Vs came along. Value, how much do you value the data? And then there were seven Vs. You know, how much does it vary? And how can you visualize it? And, you know, at this point, it begins to resemble that old Monty Python sketch of the Spanish Inquisition. But in reality, what you can see is big data isn't just a single problem. It's a multi-dimensional problem of at least seven dimensions. And every problem is different depending on where your problem lies in this seven dimensional space. Uh, well, so that leads you somewhere, but it doesn't give us a definition. So, you know, I went to Wikipedia just like everyone else does. And this is what a reasonable definition. It's basically a field that treats ways to analyze, systematically extract information from, and otherwise deal with data sets that are too large or too complex to be dealt with by traditional data processing software. And I think this is quite a good definition. It just means that it's a, it's just where your data processing problems aren't dominated by your algorithms, but dominated by the actual size of the data that you've got. And another way of looking at it is highlighted in this graph. This shows the total amount of data in the world, and the blue line is the total amount of analog data in the world, and the orange line is the total amount of digital data in the world. And not uncoincidentally, big data became a buzzword somewhere around 2000 where the crossover came. And this is because digital data is by its very nature, far more easy to process and analyze and extract information from than analog data. With analog data, a lot of the time, the only thing you can do is look at it or listen to it or other things like this. Whereas digital data can be processed by digital machines, of course, and this creates is where the problem starts. Now, that, that's, that's fair enough. So big data became a topic in around 2000. But in reality, this depends on your context and where you where you come from it. So if you draw the timeline back down to 1950 and work out when the total amount of digital data in a particular area became greater than the amount of analog data, you find that in optical astronomy, the digital crossover came around the 1990s. And that's where big data started becoming a problem. That, that was when they started digitizing all the big optical survey plates from the survey telescopes like the Palomar Telescope and the UK Schmidt in Australia. And so at that point, we suddenly started getting swamped by data in optical astronomy. But in reality, in radio astronomy, we've always had to have digital data because of the way we have to process it. We cannot, the raw data we collect is not something that humans can actually usefully do much with. And you have to take that data as digital data and process it before you be, can actually do something useful with it. And this, this means that radio astronomy has always had more data than computers can, than the computing we have to deal with it. And the actual subject of radio astronomy has grown as computers grow more effective and more powerful. So this is, this is the lesson I want to, one of the lessons I want to take home with me. You know, so basically the take home messages from this first part of the talk is the processing of digital data by computers is not just a simple single problem as often implied by this big data term, but it's a multi-dimensional problem space with a large number of approaches. Secondly, the rise of big data is the natural result of the majority of the world's data now being in digital form. And finally, in radio astronomy, the majority of our data has always been digital. And so big data has been always with us. Let's go and have a look at this history in more, oh, I'll go and look at this history in more detail, but first 
I want to talk a little bit about radio astronomy. So starting off with this animation. So how do we get from giant telescopes to torrents of data? The journey from a photon to an exabyte starts here. Radio waves emitted by objects in the universe reach the Earth and our telescopes, bouncing off the dishes and landing on the receivers. Put simply, radio waves induce voltages in the antennas and receivers that capture them. And modern technology allows us to digitize these voltages to higher precision than ever before. Optical fibers transport the digitized data from the telescopes to what we call central processing facilities, or CPFs for short. The CPF is where the signals are combined together using FPGAs and GPUs. But to do that successfully, we must first synchronize the data to make sure that it enters the processing chain exactly when it should. This is to account for the fact that our radio signal from space reached one antenna before reaching another. We need to correct that phase offset so we can combine our signals. Once the signals have been separated in frequency, there are two ways that we can then process them, which depend on what we're looking for. We can either stack the signals together from the various antennas, for what we call time domain data. Now, each stacking operation corresponds to a different direction on the sky. We'll be able to look in 2,000 such directions across both telescopes simultaneously. This time domain processing allows us to detect repeating objects such as pulsars or one-off events like gamma ray explosions and fast radio bursts. Excitingly, we can also use these radio signals to make images of the sky. And to do that, we take the signals from each pair of antennas, each baseline, and effectively multiply them together, generating data objects that we call visibilities. You can see this being done here for a few signals, but imagine it will be done for 200 dishes and 512 groups of antennas. That's 150,000 baselines and 65,000 different frequencies. That makes up to 10 billion different data streams. Once they have been processed, the data then sent off on more fiber optic cables to our science data processors or SDPs. There will be two of these great supercomputers, one in Cape Town in South Africa for our dish array and one in Perth in Western Australia for our low frequency antennas. The incoming data sets are about 10 petabytes in size and our output 3D images are 50,000 pixels on each axis. That's a thousand desktop hard drives, one petabyte per 3D image. So once the data products leave the science data processes, they will be distributed to SKA regional centers around the globe. And every year we'll be distributing up to 700 petabytes of data. Scientists typically work in teams of experts from half a dozen to many dozens or even hundreds spread across the globe. The information that SKA generates will really become knowledge and eventually wisdom. Wisdom is connected knowledge our global collective understanding of the meaning of the discoveries we've made and what they say of the human condition and our place in the universe. So although SKA isn't exactly easy, I hope you'll agree that it's worth a little extra homework. Thank, Thank you. you. I hope that video came through okay. I thought I'd put the video in because it gave you a pretty good rundown of what the SKA is. But I'll just go through that in pictorial form just again, just to reinforce the message. So basically, the way we do um, imaging radio astronomy is we start off with this astronomical signal, which is coming in as an electromagnetic wave. And then we collect it in different the selection of antennas distributed around the country, and we amplify the signals. And then we take eat the signal from each antenna and we digitize it and then we delay it so that we recover that wave front from where it's originally coming from. So the telescope, the red telescope here needs to delay the signal more than the purple telescope because the signal arrives at it first. Then after you've delayed the signal so you've got a single wave front, you then correlate the signal. So that means that you take every pair of antennas and, pro and do a cross correlation of the two signals from those two antennas and output the result. This is what we call the visibilities. And then when you have all these cross correlations, you then send it and you process it and you turn that in th those cross correlations into images. Now, the data rate 
at this point where the arrow is, which is where I'm going to be using it because that's the input to the computer, is basically proportional to the number of antenna, antennas squared because you've got taking every pair of an, um, antennas, so that's n times n minus 1 on 2, times the sampling rate, times the number size, you know, the number of bits in your number, times the number of polarizations, which is typically 4, times the number of frequency channels. So that, that generates a basic data rate for every antenna. And I'm going to look through history and see how big the data rate problems were at every point. And then, you know, what's the processing required? Mathematically, it's expressed in this formula, which is known as the Van Sittek Zanecki theorem. And the gamma on the left hand side is the, this coherence function, which is basically the um, cross correlation between any two pairs of antennas. And what this formula says is that cross correlation is the Fourier transform of the intensity pattern of the sky, which is the ILM on the other side. And so what we have to do is take these cross correlations and do the inverse two-dimensional Fourier transform to of the correlator, the output, to generate these images. So that's the processing we're doing. So that's, you know, so all through history, that has been the processing we've been doing with radio telescopes. So historically, Back in the 40s and 50s, this was done manually. And we had these aids, a bit like sly rules, but they were pieces of paper which were had numbers written on them, and they actually had all the multiplications done for you for two digit Fourier transforms. And then you got collected the right pieces of paper out and laid them along side each other and then added up down the columns, and that generated the intensity for a single point in the sky, and then you move to the next point. And so with these, you could do about a 25 by 25 array to about two digits with one person in 24 hours. And here's an example of um, an old colleague of mine called Peter Scheuer at Cambridge, who recreated this back in the 80s. Um, I think it was a, a labour of love, but it was uh, clearly, you know, there was a lot of effort to do 25 by 25 numbers in 12, 24 hours. So back in the 50s, they thought, this is too difficult. Let's try and use one of these new things called computers. And in, in the University of Cambridge, which is where a lot of this early work happened, they were also on the forefront of developing digital computers. And in 1949, this computer called ADSAC was developed for the university. It ran for about 10 years, and it was the first practical stored program machine for, that came into use. And this was being used for radio astronomy. So this was really at the forefront of big data and computing at the time. It took it could do a 360 by 38.1D Fourier transform in 15 hours. And it did about 2 million operations. The input and output was 5-bit paper tape. The memory for this machine was 1024, and that's 1024, not 1024 kilobytes, megabytes, or gigabytes. It's 1024 18-bit words, and they were stored in mercury delay lines. So basically, the words were circulating around a delay line, and when you um, wrote your program, you had to make sure that the program, the word was available at the time it went past the delay point, and so you could read it. Anyway, so things have changed since then. But, you know, 10 years later, EDSAC-2 came into operation. And this was used again for radio astronomy. And now it was doing two-dimensional Fourier transforms. And the input data was about 162,000 complex numbers. It took a full night on this machine called EDSAC-2, which had, it still only had, it had 1,024 40-bit words, but the words were bigger, and it also had some read-only memory, 768 words of read-only memory. This was the, the first computer with microprogramming architecture, too, so it was quite revolutionary at the time and one of the biggest machines available. So this was the result. Basically, this, this was the, on the left-hand side of the telescope, and on the right-hand side was the map that was generated, and this map was taken by tracing 48 photographs of cathode ray screens, like old TV sets. And, you know, this was, you know, clearly a lot of manual intensive effort, but this is what was happening back in those days, and it was a huge amount of data from those days. And, you know, you can see 
in the use of um, computing, like in Cambridge radio astronomy papers, clearly computers were a big thing and were the only reason why we could process the, the huge amounts of data or relatively huge amounts of data that were being available. Okay, let's let's move on a few years into the late 60s and early 70s. And the biggest telescope for about 10 years was the Vesterbalk telescope in the Netherlands. It comprised of 12 25 meters antennas. And each there were 20 baselines, so they took 20 pairs of antennas. So it wasn't <clears throat> um, all the baselines they could do, but it's there were 20 baselines total. This generated 80 complex numbers every 10 seconds. So the full data output was typically about five megabytes for a for an image. And this telescope is still operational today. And the initial data processing was done on an IBM 370. So again, a fairly state-of-the-art machine at the time. Later, about 10 years after that, in the late, late 1970s and early 1980s, the astronomy, radio astronomy became dominated for about 20 years by the very large array. It was a huge step forward from 20 baselines. It had 351 baselines. And this made a huge difference from um, of a factor of 20 odd. Then the big step forward was 256 frequency channels. This this took the data up by rate up by that amount. And that meant that there were sort of 400,000 now complex numbers in 24 hours. More than that, sorry. Um, if I 400,000 complex, that, that, that's a typo, sorry. But 36 kilobytes per second total. And so the, what, you know, this now managed to stay to provide, was able to provide these really high resolution, high fidelity maps. It was a huge step forward to radio astronomy. But at the time when they were building it, they really had no idea how to process the data. They, a planning committee said that they clearly would need a network of machines rather than a single conventional computer. So this is the first time we thought of basically having to have more than one machine, but they didn't really know what the network was about. This was really before the invention of Ethernet. Um, there was, they recognized there was no digital machine available at the time. They did hope that in fact, they were gonna um, be able to find an analog optical system which could do most of the imaging. And they actually spent a lot of time looking at this esoteric analog optical system to no avail. And they wasted quite a lot of time doing that. In the end, they did end up with very, fairly conventional systems, but they basically could not process any uh, anything like the quantity of data they got generated in the early days. Then we move on another, as I said, about 20, 25 years to the 2000s, which is looking at the LOFAR telescope now. The LOFAR telescope was sort of a truly continental telescope, and it had 48 stations. These are the green dots in the upper right here. And over a thousand baselines, one second sampling, 60,000 frequency channels, and about 12 trillion complex numbers in 12 hours. So in each of these stations, doesn't look like a traditional antenna anymore. They're, they look like, there's a picture of them. They look like fields of, actually at heart, they're fields of something like television aerials or ham radio aerials. Because when you get down to these lower frequencies, which was about 100 megahertz, it's not efficient to build antennas. The antennas have to be too big. So we now, in these low frequencies, we use a different sort of antenna, a bit like, as I said, a bit like an television aerial. Originally, for processing, they used an IBM Blue Gene system, which was a big supercomputer available at the time. But what they found out was that it was too specialist for what they work. It wasn't tailored to the work they did. And there's a slide here which shows how things have evolved in LOFAR over 10 years, where they had these Blue Gene, this initially had a Blue Gene L, then the Blue Gene P. And then they replaced it with very conventional um, GPU system. And now a couple of years ago, they placed that with a new version of the GPU system. So they've gone down from many, many racks, like we saw in the previous picture, now down to one rack. And the more, it's a, the 
processing power has gone up by a factor of 10. But in reality, the biggest thing is that it ha can handle the data much better. So that's a lesson to be learned that actually going and getting standard machines, which is basically the, the standard machine, which is the best able to handle your data and building systems out of these standard machines is usually a better way of doing it than hoping that you know you can just get something with a system which has at heart you know it seems to have very good numbers but it doesn't actually work for your application so then we get on to the late 2000s the SKA and as said in the introduction there are 197 antennas in South Africa as you can see on the right hand side and 512 stations on the left hand side so um the you know the real big change that has happened is that there is now over 100,000 baselines that's a huge increase and 0.1 second sampling so this, the sample rate has to go down because um to view the very wide fields of view that we see the you have to take the sampling down because otherwise things at the edge of the field are moving so fast you get what we call um, an aberration so and these systems are now um, generating this is 10 to the 15 complex numbers in 12 hours and the data rates of the order of a terabyte a second so again another huge step forward so if we put all these numbers on a graph what we find out is that there if you put it on a log scale there are roughly straight lines and the doubling time since the big, basically the middle of the 1950s so based in around 70 years the doubling time has been about 20 every 20 months and this is very much along the lines of computer doubling times transistor doubling times all these other doubling times like Moore's law that's there um, of course we're facing problems nowadays that we're running out of um, CPU time, CPU power, but um, it's sort of saying that it's SKA, whilst it is a huge step forward, it is basically quite, you know, it is just another step on the way. So what is really, really different about the SKA? Let's have a look at the SKA and its data challenges. So as we said, before earlier, SKA comprises of two telescopes, one in Australia in the Murchison Desert, one in the Karoo Desert down in South Africa here, um, and a global headquarters in Jodrell Bank next to the next to the Lovell Telescope um, in the UK. It's a big international organisation, and you know it's got huge numbers of science drivers. We're looking at testing general relativity using gravitational waves looking at planets and molecules, looking at cosmic mag magnetism, how it's, what's its origin and what its evolution was. The, the very big thing is the first stars and galaxies, trying to understand how they formed, because at, at the moment there's a period between half a million years after the Big Bang and half a billion years after the Big Bang, where we have never been able to see any images from. And the SK is going to be probing that area looking at galaxy evolution, cosmology, and of course, exploration of the unknown. So in some senses, the SKA does have the broadest range of science of any observatory. In overview, in terms of the networks, it looks a bit like this. So um, this has the low telescope on the left-hand side and the mid telescope on the right-hand side. And so there's basically all these remote stations that connect through remote processing facilities to a central processing facility. And the black line is the main data flow, goes to the science processing center to the regional centers. Similarly, on the um, right hand side is South Africa, where we have the dishes going through a central processing facility, as we saw in the video, science processing center. And then we go out to these regional centers around the world. In terms of numbers, it looks a bit like this. We're talking two petabits per second. Sorry. Two petabits per second in the low telescope coming off the antennas. That gets reduced to about seven terabits per second. 
um, by things called tile processing modules. And they go down through signal lines to a, the central signal processor, which is, a, we, is estimated around 50 petaflops. And then that goes down to the science data processor, which is about 225 petaflop systems. But it, and interestingly, whilst we're, well, they're rated 125 petaflops, in reality, we're only going to get about 12 petaflops sustained. And this is an interesting point because that means that the systems are actually spending 90% of their time idle. And that's purely because we have, that's they're waiting for data to arrive because there's so much data, we cannot feed the processes fast enough. Then there's of course a control system that controls it all. And of course, there's also this thing, whereas a lot of the equipment is out in the desert, the big data processing centers are in Cape Town and Perth. So there's about um, 600 kilometers. And actually, and then we push the data out into the regional centers. Actually, recently we moved the central signal processor, the design, so the central signal processor is now in Perth. So the big line link is now here between um, the antennas and all the processing is now taking place in Perth and Cape Town. So looking at an overview of the software, this is a picture of the main data flow, again, reflecting the picture you saw in the video. Um, we have the dishes, the correlator beam former, pulsar search, these things are pulsar search and pulsar timing. So these are the things that are looking at the real time signals. And this is the science data processor, which is focusing on imaging. And then the data goes off to the regional centers. But as with all software, this main pipeline is only half of it. In fact, around all this is all sorts of systems. Sorry, I'm, I'm, I've just ring those because they're the, they're the systems I'm going to talk about in the future. But ar around all this is all the control systems and the operating systems and all those systems that we need to make these things work. And then they go off and link to external systems such as the infrastructure and management. And we've got to have author, get the author, authentication and authorization to make sure only the right people can access them. And then you link to all the other systems and outside in the world. So even though the data flow we see is you know, relatively simple, what I always find in software is it's the plumbing that's the biggest problem, is actually trying to get all the systems to work together properly. The, in many ways, the, um, the basic data flow is relatively easy to understand. Anyway, so that's the software overview. So, so what is different about the SKA? Because we've said in radio astronomy, big data has always been with us. And the biggest problem for the SKA is one of scale. You know, our systems are physically bigger and have more processes and connections than ever before. And so to avoid random or chaotic results, we require much better engineering practices, far more testants, testing and far more resilient behavior. And this scale is not just technical, but it's human. You know, there's thousands of person years involved in the software development rather ten than tens or hundreds. When human, you know, there's a certain amount that a human brain can hold. And once you scale something up to a much bigger human scale, the challenges become much larger. So let's look at some of these systems in a little bit more detail, just so that we understand some approaches you can take to big data. So the correlator, the design is basically a massive parallel linear data pipeline. You take the frequency bands that the telescope has, and then you slice it up into small sub bands that can each be processed by a single processor. Now, to do this, you've got to get a particular band of a certain frequency from all the antennas to one particular processor. And then you have lots of processes like that. And so it becomes a very big network problem to reduce the, redistribute the data. So the same frequency channel from all the antennas goes to one processor. So that's that's one of the big problems there. Once the, you've got the data in the processor, each frequency is independent. So a simple massively parallel approach is appropriate. So this, this actually makes quite a resilient system. So that if you lose one processor, 
you only just lose that one frequency band, and that may not be such a bad thing. Um, and you only have to design actually one system, and then you just go and buy many more components. So that's that's quite a good approach, and it's been made possible by advances in networking. What we're using is a new sort of network switch called a P4 um, network switch, which uses a programming language, which you can actually program the switch to direct the data. You you don't actually have to have that much knowledge a priori. You can actually program in the switch where the data goes. Um, and that can switch at very, very high data rates. It's got, there's a, here's an example of one with 6,400 gigabit ports, and it can propose, take the data. So you could think 32 of these ports could be antennas and 32 ports could be processor units. And it does the switching that we need to do in using this P4 programming language. And then the, for processing, we use these Xilinx U50 FPGA cards, which have a 100 gigabit Ethernet interface in it and a, and a FPGA card. So this, this basic combination allows a software approach to what was traditionally a electronic problem. And it makes the system much more flexible and expandable. It simplifies the coding because a lot of the processing we used to have to do was actually in the moving the data around, which was now done by this off the shelf switch. So, you know, what we do is we have 20 of these cards in each server. And we have each card can either do what the time domain processing, which is the one on the bottom here, or the image domain processing, which is one at the top here. We have 420 of them in total, 200 for image domain processing and 192 for the beamformer and some spares. The single 100 gigabit interface brings the data in and takes the data out. And it's basically going full out, flat, flat out all the time, but it, you know the systems can do, handle this. And then once we've got these 20 FPGAs in a rack, in a rack we then have um, about 25 odd, 20 to 25, servers fully populated and all the switches and it just goes into four racks so it's, it's a reasonably manageable system for something which i think is about 50 petaflops and it's and it's all massively parallel and reasonably easy to manage so that's the um that, that's the central signal processor now i'll move on to the science data processor and the sdp is different because it has to handle a lot of different algorithms. It's not just doing one thing and doing it well, or two things. It needs a flexible system that needs to be, that can be easily reprogrammed to handle new algorithms. The workflows, the approach is that we have to take every algorithm we want to do and describe it as a workflow, which is a series of tasks which act on data. So it's the, you focus on the data flow through the system and you have these tasks that you instantiate and the data flows from one task to the other and there's a task manage based architecture which manages the debater dependencies and that it's set up as a, their tasks are set up as a directed isocyclic graph or dag as they call it in the trade but basically it's it's one of these connected graphs and so each of these colors is each of these boxes is a task here. So you put the data in here, then one task transfers it out and does model parallel ones, then it might have to bring things back in, do a bit more processing. So the tasks have to be implemented as pure functions, so they're referentially transparent, and the data dependencies are described this by this acyclic graph. Now, one of the benefits of this approach is that it's a very common approach for the other big data software doesn't mean you have to rewrite your algorithms to be um, expressed in this way. But once you've done that, there are many packages implement such task-based processing on directed graphs, things like Spark or Dask. And so we can make use of um, well-tried and true software that's available elsewhere and developed elsewhere in the community. The biggest challenge though for the science data processor 
is it had it has two main challenges functions. One is it has to create images for the data, but the second it has to correct the data input for errors introduced in collection. So where can these errors come from? Some of them just come from the data propagation through the um, through the ionosphere or the troposphere, and so each and that can change as the climate changes or as and it can change on time scales of minutes. So you have to be continuously measuring these with with the data. And you have to also there's differences because of temperature or whatever between antennas and signal paths. And so the problem really is that no matter how you divide up the data, whether you divide it up in frequency or spacious there's the space, there are dependencies. Because we have to ensure the connection cor corrections introduced to make you know, to correct for all these um, errors still have no jumps where the when we stitch everything back together and join things up. You know, and the only way we can do this is we to, to, to actually work out what the numbers are, these correction numbers are. We have an iterative process, but then we also have to. So we do this, we do it one iteration, and then we have to compare the results to make sure that the joins are appropriate. And that means we have to bring all the data together and that introduces the dependency. And that, that's that's a real problem in trying to do the data to process data efficiency because when you've got a dependency everything has to stop until the slowest process catches up and that means that all your system is again sitting idle waiting for one single system to arrive so that that's that's a real problem for us but anyway you know we can you know we still are doing it this way we are do it we can Take the approach of fake frequency parallelization, a bit like the correlator does, and that's widely used in current systems. But it has this problem where you find out there's a jump in the frequency calibration between one processing node and the next, and so then you have to work out how to correct for that jump. Alternatively, you can do um, break it up into tiles on on the sky, so there's you can um, do um, spatial parallelism and one of the advantages of this is that um, often the distortions are related to the directions you're looking at in the sky and so that that means that the errors are local for that processing whereas if you're looking in the frequency space you've got to look over the whole sky anyway so there are these approaches but the SDP is fundamentally more complicated than the correlator beam formula I was talking about earlier anyway the, so the way the software works basically is you get the data in and there's some real time processing and then you write it off to a buffer and then some batch processing after that you then try and schedule afterwards using available um, computing. There's long term storage and there's quality assessment and then you deliver it out to the regional centers. What we have to do is part, an essential part of all the calibration is to have these model databases which show what the constraints are how we know the um, the visibilities must behave, and then of course there's the execution control, the plumbing that makes sure everything works together, and then there's the communication with all the other telescope systems. The hardware design is still very much up in the air, but we do have some baseline hardware designs. But what we, we do know is that we need a number of networks. We need high throughput networks and we need low latency networks and we'll need a management network. We also need different personalities of server because we've got to do these different, basically different operations. So we've got to do receive the data. So that's got to be make sure that you can you're optimized for receiving data from the network and making sure there are no dropped messages. You need pro main processing systems. You need some service systems to handle the routine tasks, and you need some storage systems to store the data. We're thinking we'll basically arrange these in clusters of compute racks, and then they'll be connected through interconnection systems. And finally, of course, there's preser preservation systems where we, you know, the big tape stores where we we'll store the data. So that's that's. An overview of the two two of the biggest big data systems on the SKA. So I move on now on to conclusions. 
And I think the big data lessons are that systems have to be reliable and resilient. If you're going to do a billion operations a second and the chance of a problem are one in a million, then you have a thousand problems a second. And so clearly this is this is a big issue. You also have to try and make your data processing streams as independent as you can, if that's at all possible. So this might mean you use different algorithms than you would have otherwise done. Because dependency between processing streams means one problem can stop everything. Now, third one is that more processing power isn't the solution. Since our CPUs will be 90% idle, waiting for the time to run, adding an extra CPU doesn't actually make things any better. You, your algorithm has to fundamentally un, take into account how the data is moving around the system. And so they must have this data management at their core. So this often may lead to different mathematical approaches than you would normally think. And finally, this one is that specialized hardware is very risky. So if we've looked at the history and we've found out that whenever you look at using specialized hardware, there it, there's risks because of the development time, it doesn't come to fruition. So you need to stick to that tried and tested. So in summary, big data is not a single problem, but a multi-dimensional problem. Every problem is different, but there are classes of solution. Traditional ways of measuring performance are irrelevant if the workflow means your system is 90% idle. Radio astronomy has always had large amounts of digital data and has always faced these challenges. And finally, the SKA is a huge technical system, but historical lessons have taught us that the best solutions are close to mainstream. These are more reliable and have a real risk. So I think that's the end. I hope you've enjoyed it. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for this absolutely out of this world webinar, which was greatly educational and eye opening for all of us. And now, if there are any questions, uh, the platform is open. And you can put it up in the live chat. Um, all right, so, so we have the first question. Yep. Yeah, it is uh, How does having a load of satellites in South Africa and Australia effectively reproduce a square kilometer sized telescope? Uh, if the earth is convex while well, the telescope is concave right so the collecting area is sure purely the sum of the areas of all the individual telescopes and so in fact it's not quite a square kilometer in fact and and at the mid range it's it's quite a, it's quite a lot less than a square kilometer at low frequencies in low it is nearly half a square kilometer but with, in radio astronomy, you can measure the the amplitude and phase of the signal at every point. So, and then you can effectively advance or retard that to flatten out the um, the the wave front. So, e even though you detect the signal, you know, a couple of microseconds on what the one and the signal from a source with one antenna a couple of microseconds earlier than the other, you can delay that signal and then you have to add them all up together so that they um, are appropriate. You can't, it's very much more difficult to do this, of course, in the optical astronomy because in optical astronomy, you don't get both amplitude and phase. But in radio astronomy, we basically have phase sensitive detectors and we can work out, we can, we detect both the amplitude and the phase of the signal. Does that help? Yes, sir. It answers more the question quite well. Thank you so much, sir. So the next question we have is how can the data be accurately synchronized between two continents in the presence of a timing delay due to relativity? Right. Okay. One thing is that we don't synchronize the data between two telescopes between two continents, but we that is that is possible. And one way you do that and that's done with systems called very long baseline interferometers. And the trick with that is to have a bit of an idea of what the sky really looks like. And the radio sky is dominated by some very, very bright sources. And so you can 
basically look for the signal from those sources and you know what those sources, the signal from those sources should look like. And that helps you adjust the, um, the delays so that you, that the signal from that source is in, in correct. And then once you've understood that those delays, you can then start looking at other parts of the sky. Now with um, the SKA, we've still got very, very large distances in South Africa and Australia. And so even there is a challenge, but it's basically we can, we can just, we distribute a timing signal to all the antennas and that's a precise timing signal and that comes from a signal source. And the important thing for us there in the, for our um, time domain astronomy is we, that timing signal has to be right to 10 nanoseconds over about um, 10 years, which is better than, it's, it's basically the world's best timing system because we're trying to measure variations of pulsars. So th there's there's quite a lot of work in doing that, but yes, I can assure you it's possible and we, we have to synchronize with the world's time best timing systems. And in all that synchronization, yes, you have to take relativity, general relativity into account. And then that, you know, the gravitational field at the, at the site where we're generating that timing signal is important, yeah. So there's another question. Yep. Uh, what is the strategic importance of having one telescope field in South Africa and the other in Australia? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the strategic importance, but I, I think the 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 southern hemisphere, in many ways, is much more interesting astronomically than the northern hemisphere because you've got a much better view of the galaxy because the galaxy, the core of the galaxy is mainly in the southern hem hemisphere. Um, the other thing is that being a radio telescope, you have to be in radio, radio quiet areas. And, you know, that means basically you have to be in effectively in a desert where nobody lives. And so the Murchison Desert in Australia, you know, there's there's thousands of square miles where there's basically no one living there because, you know, modern cell phone technology and Wi-Fi technology is, is basically an anathema to anything to do with radio astronomy. So that's, you know, one of the other reasons for the choice of the two sites. So, and the last question we have is that what would be a possible way to speed up the transmission of data so as to use the supercomputer at a better efficiency? Ah, very a very good question. And if 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 you if you know the answer to that, let us know, <laughs> because that's that's fundamentally the problem. Because you know all computer systems get a lot of their performance by clevocation technology. So you have, you know, you'll have very slow spinning disks, and then you'll have a bit of solid state memory, and then you'll go into computer memory. Then you'll go to you know L two cache. And then L1 cache. And all of this works because under the assumption that compute is localized. And the problem with big data is it breaks all these, these assumptions because none of this caching system works if you're only ever going to use the data once and you need to um, process all a very large amount of it because the amount of data you can get to the CPU is limited by the slowest possible transmission, which is in the extreme case, the data rate off the spinning disk. Now, you know, and a lot of this comes down to physics because um, if you have a large amount of data, it physically takes up a large amount of space and you cannot move data faster than the speed of light. So if you've, if you've got data taking up a large amount of space, you cannot get it to the system any faster than the speed of light. And of course it's, it's slower than that. And so this means that you have to start having more innovative algorithms like slicing the data up just so there's lots of small independent chunks, chunks that can be kept close to the CPU. But in reality, if you've got a problem which cannot be sliced up in any way like that. It is very, very difficult, but you know, this is where the algorithms are vitally important. Uh, 
Um, thank you, sir, for answering all of our questions so enthusiastically. This brings us to the end of our event. With this, we come to an end of the Tech Expo webinar series. Thank you all for staying tuned with us throughout. Hope you all gain insight on these wide array of topics covered in the webinar series. We look forward to seeing you all actively engaged in the MindSpark event and hence contributing to the success of the 15th edition of MindSpark. We would also like to thank Dr. B.B. Ahuja, Director of College of Engineering, Pune, Dr. M.S. Sitaone, Deputy Director of College of Engineering, Pune, Dr. P.R. Dhaman Gaukar, Associate, uh, Associate Dean Student Affairs of College of Engineering, Pune, Dr. S. Uh, Dr. Aarti S. Petkar, Faculty Advisor of MindSpark, for their valuable guidance. We would also like to express our gratitude towards Digital India, AICTE, and UNESCO for the support as patronage to MindSpark 21, and are looking forward to the continued support. I would also like to thank the audience for the interest and attention. Once again, we would like to thank our esteemed speaker for joining us today. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. It was really informative, and we really liked it all. Thank you. I, I, yes, I was a bit worried because as the, is, is it, have we turned off the YouTube channel? Have we turned off the YouTube channel? You'll have to check. Uh, yeah. Just a second, sir. So.